God above all things and all that we do. Let's pray and, and do that. Let's seek God and ask him to speak to us this morning through his word and, uh, and, and convict us of, of sin in our lives and, and show us his grace and mercy through all that he gives us. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We come to you as your people, Lord, as, as ones who want to seek your face. Lord, give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts this morning as we open your word. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. We pray that you would speak to us and, and show us your will. Show us what you want us to know individually. Lord, we are so grateful that you have chosen to speak to us through your word, that you have given us the Bible to communicate your message to us. We are so grateful that you sent Jesus to this earth to live a life that we could not live, a perfect, sinless life, to die the death that we deserved on the cross so that by his resurrection and through your grace poured out in faith, we can be reunited with you. We can be reconciled to you. And so this morning, Lord, we pray that we would come with expectant hearts, with hearts of gratitude, humbly before you, because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles, or if you use an app, or whatever you use this morning. We live in an unparalleled time of information. We have opportunities, even at our very fingertips, to access more information than any other generation in human history. And as you know, a lot of the information that we have access to that is called Christian is unbiblical. It's unbiblical. In America today, we have set up a culture where anything, can, we can slap the name Christian on it, and people will buy into it. People will consume it because it has the name Christian slapped onto it. Last week when we were looking at the life of Jesus, Jesus talked to his people, and one of the things that he told them is you have to be discerning. You have to be able to discern truth from untruth, biblical from unbiblical. And today, for us who are Christians, that is more important than even ever before, as there is more information to take in. I remember back in the late 90s, I was in college, and I remember one day, I was in my room, and I stumbled upon a TV station I'd never seen in my life. There's a TV station by the name of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, or TBN, as maybe you might be familiar. This TV station was a self-proclaimed Christian station that was broadcast throughout the whole world. Now, when I stumbled onto this TBN station, there were a couple names that I recognized. There was Charles Stanley, there was Tony Evans... Uh, but for me, many of the names that came across that screen were new. I'd never heard of them before. And in fact, there was new theology that I had never heard before. Over the next several years, as I finished out college and, and I went on to seminary, I, I became more and more familiar with the theology that was proponents uh, on TBN, uh, the names that they promoted through there were called Word Faith Preachers. Word Faith Preachers. Now, maybe some of you, when I say that, will recognize some of the names that were big in this movement. Names like Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Oral Roberts, Kenneth Hagen. And actually, I found out that one of the biggest ones in the whole movement was right down the street from where I grew up, a guy by the name of Robert Tilton. 
Now, if none of those names ring a bell to you, you might be more familiar with some of the modern day guys like Joel Osteen or Joyce Myers, who are part of the Word Faith Movement as well. The Word Faith Movement is huge. It is a worldwide movement that had become popularized because of the network of TBN. Uh, many of the books that they have written over the years that have been pushed out by bookstores like Mardell, ChristianBooks.com, and others throughout the world. And they're really famous for how they are able to reach in and by guilt get you to line their pockets with money because they'll teach you that if you bless their ministry financially, God will bless you. That's how it works. You send them money... And God will bless you because you're blessing them. Now there's a ton we can get into about the Word Faith Movement. But today, there's one particular aspect of this movement that corresponds with what Christ is teaching about today. And it is the notion that they teach, and it's one of their biggest notions, is that the work of Christ on the cross, the atoning work of Christ on the cross guarantees for believers that you should not experience sickness in your life, but you should be able to live in perfect health. It's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? It's a pretty bold statement. Their favorite verse, when you look at them, is Isaiah 53, 5. It says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Not just spiritually, not just the, the cross didn't just spiritually heal us, but the cross actually physically guarantees our health. Now, maybe some of you are sitting there going, wait a second, what about all of us that get sick, right? We get sick. Well, for the Word Faith teachers, the proponents of this movement, when you experience sickness in your life, the reason you are experiencing it is because you just lack faith. You don't have enough faith, enough trust in God to experience his deliverance. That's the problem. Benny Hinn, one of the chief proponents, one of the biggest names in the Word Faith movement, said this, the Bible declares that the work was done 2,000 years ago. God is not going to heal you now. He healed you over 2,000 years ago. All you have to do today is receive your healing by faith. Folks, all you have to do is have a little faith. All you have to do is have a little faith. You have the cold today? Maybe somebody's got the flu have you got a thyroid problem, cancer? Shame on you. Shame on you. You shouldn't. Now, here's what I need you to do, though, if you're going to be a proponent. I need you to put aside all the tons of scripture that says that sin and sickness go hand in hand. That part of the fall is that people get sick. People die. I need you to put that to the side, okay? I also need you to put to the side the fact that throughout the scriptures, it says that God specifically uses sickness for his purposes. King Uzziah, God gave him leprosy to teach him a lesson. King Nebuchadnezzar was driven mad in the head for God's purposes. The apostle Paul was blinded. He has a thorn in his side. For God's purposes. But I need you to put that to the side. Because the reason you get sick is you just don't have enough faith. Kenneth Hagin, one of the founders of the Word Faith Movement, says this. I am fully convinced. I would die saying it is so. That it is the plan of our Father God in his great love and in his great mercy. That no believer should ever be sick. That every believer should live his full lifespan down here on the earth. And that every believer should finally just fall asleep in Jesus. This garbage 
has destroyed so many lives. So many lives around this world. Can you imagine? You are a new Christian. You have just been introduced to Jesus Christ. And you find this. And all of a sudden you get sick. And this is the garbage that you've been told. Is that the reason you're sick is because you don't have enough faith. You're sick because you don't believe in God enough. If you just had enough faith, if you were just good enough Christian, you wouldn't get sick. It's disgusting, isn't it? But this is put all over the world for people to hear. As we're going to see in today's passage, Jesus is going to tell us it's not that simple. Good things don't just happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. You don't just happen to have this because of lack of faith or great faith. But there's more to it. Look in verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Because they suffered in this way? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So here's the scene. Jesus is in the town of Capernaum. He's ministering. That's what we've been reading over the last few weeks is Jesus was in Capernaum. And as Jesus is teaching, a group of Jews come to Jesus and say, Hey, here's something that just happened in Jerusalem that you need to know about. And so the first story we see that they convey is that Pilate had evidently murdered a group of Galileans who were there in Jerusalem at the temple to offer sacrifices. He had murdered them. And in addition to murdering them, he had taken their blood and mingled it with the sacrifices to be offered at the temple. Folks, this is horrific. For a Jew, this is the most sacrilegious thing you could do. Can you imagine if on one Sunday, while we're here and we're taking communion, a group comes in and murders a bunch of you, And then they take your blood and mix it with the juice that we're going to take for communion and make us all drink it. How horrific is that? But this is what Pilate did to these Galileans. These Galileans, remember Jesus is from Galilee. These Galileans are known to be a little fiery. Maybe some of you would be good Galileans. They were a little fiery. They weren't really big fans of Pilate. But the question is, Did they deserve that? Did they deserve that? Were they worse people than any other that they deserved to be slaughtered in the temple area while they're offering sacrifices? No, they weren't worse. But look at this. Look at at Jesus' reaction. Look at how he reacts to this. He didn't address the awful event, did he? He didn't address it. I think what happened was these Jews came to Jesus because they wanted this Jesus, this Messiah. Remember, their thought was that the Messiah is going to be this revolutionary figure that's going to overthrow the Romans and put Israel as a nation in their rightful place. And so they're coming to Jesus and they're saying, hey, Jesus, I know they've done a lot of bad things, but listen to this. And their hope is that they're about to have a Braveheart moment where Jesus is about to gather the troops and go kill the Romans. I think think that's what their hope is. But instead, look at what he does. He doesn't address the event, but instead he warns them, if you don't repent, this is going to happen to you as well. And it does. In AD 70, just a few decades later, the Roman Empire is going to crush Israel And level the temple. It's coming. The second story is we see it that a tower fell and it killed 18 people. Now, there's no historical record that we can find about this actual story, but 
in that time, Pilate was a great architect and he built a lot of stuff. And so the fact that a tower might have fell and killed people, very likely to happen. But, but why did those 18 die? Why, why them? Were, were the 18 that died in this tower, were, were they extra evil? Did they deserve it? Look again. Look how Jesus answers. He doesn't address the concern, does he? He doesn't address it, but instead he once again tells the people, repent, or this could happen to you. Today, we look at the news, and we see story after story of mass shootings. We see stories of natural disasters where tidal waves come in and wipe out whole villages, right? We see all sorts of things that happen in our world, and the only thing we can do is go, God, why? Why? Why, why is this happening to these people? Why is the, those kids or those adults the ones that died? Why, why is that village the one that is destroyed by the hurricane or the tornado that rips through the Midwest? Why, why them? Why them? Well, if you're a word faith person, then it's because those people didn't have enough faith. That's their problem. They didn't have enough faith. For most people in this world, we believe in karma. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. That's the general consensus of people in this world as they think of that. You look in the Bible, you go back to the story of somebody like a Job. And what we see from the story of Job and we see throughout other stories is that the people of Israel had this same concept. They believed that God punished bad people and God blessed good people. So it's very simple. You might remember the story of Jesus when the people came to Jesus and there was a guy who was paralyzed. And they said, is it his parents' fault or is it his fault? What's wrong? Why, why is he sick is it, did his parents cause it or did he cause it? Because obviously you're punishing, God's punishing him. This was the mindset of the Israelites when they came to Jesus. And it's the mindset that many of the people today have. Is that good people, good things. Bad people, bad things. But Jesus says it's not that simple, guys. It's not that simple. And what Jesus is telling his audience is that many of the things that happen in this world have absolutely nothing to do with whether you're a good or a bad person. Nothing to do with that. You can't look at that. You might remember over the last several weeks, as we've been looking at Jesus talking to people, that he's been telling them that it's really important that you be ready. That you be ready that you have discernment, that you reconcile with God and get your affairs in order. The reason Jesus is telling us that is because the world is broken up into two different types of people. All the people in the world, every country, every tribe, every tongue, doesn't matter, two people. Those who have repented and trusted in Christ and those who haven't. There's only two types of people in this world. And so Jesus is telling them, death is coming. It's coming for every single person. Are you ready? Are you ready? Because you're not promised tomorrow. Folks, it's really easy when life gets hard, and it will, to think to yourself, I deserve it. I deserve it. I'm not a good enough Christian. Or I did something wrong, and so I just deserve it. I did something bad, so I deserve it. God's punishing me because I did something bad. It's really easy. But here's the truth. Evil things happen because there's sin in the world. Evil things happen because there's sin in the world. Maybe you were responsible for the sin. Maybe someone else was responsible for the sin. There is sin in this world that is a consequence of the fall. But evil things happen because there's sin in the world. The other option is that maybe God is using this season in your life to teach you something. God is going to use that hard time to teach you something. 
The Bible teaches us everything happens because of a reason. It doesn't tell us why, but it does tell us that God's in control. God is in control of everything, and he is working all things for our good and for his glory. The second movement (laughs) that we want to look at. This one's going to hit a little closer to home. This movement is taught in some Southern Baptist churches, Independent Baptist churches, Plymouth Brethren churches, non-denominational churches. Since its inception, Dallas Theological Seminary, my school, where I went, has taught, even though it's not part of their official doctrinal statement, they've had professors that have taught a movement, a theology called free grace theology. And because of the professors that taught those future pastors, also the books that they have written over the decades, this thought has gone out to millions of people all across the world as well. When I arrived on campus in 2001 to do my master's work, it wasn't as prevalent anymore. It had kind of moved out. A lot of those professors had either passed away or were very old, but it was still there. There were still books that we had to read, and there were still discussions around free grace theology. Sounds nice, though, doesn't it? Free grace theology? Sounds really nice. I mean, Ephesians 2.89 says, For by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that any should boast. Folks, if you're a Christian today, then we say yes and amen to that, right? We say yes and amen that salvation is not of our works. It is the free gift of God by grace exhibited through faith. That is our cry. That is our plea. That is our only hope. So where does free grace theology go wrong then? Free grace theology. In regards to this passage today that we're going to look at, it's a big big thing that we could talk about in the future, but in what we talk about today, the issue with free grace theology is that it insists that justification does not necessarily follow by sanctification. Let's spell that out a little bit, because that's some big scrabble words, right? Justification and sanctification. Justification is the doctrine that when you are saved by grace through faith, There is a moment, there is a break in time where you go from non-Christian to a Christian. And justification is a legal term, a court of law term that says that you have been declared by God Almighty righteous. You have been declared that you are good with God now. You weren't good a second ago, but now you are good through faith. You have been declared. Just like in a court of law, if the judge says you're not guilty... Now, here's the kill. Here's the thing. Are you not guilty anymore? No, you're still guilty, right? You still sin. Every one of us, we still sin. But what it is saying, the doctrine of justification is saying that even though you sin, when God looks at you, he says, you are now declared by me not guilty because of Jesus. When I see your sin, I see Jesus. I see the blood of Jesus covering your sin. So now you are not guilty anymore. Sanctification is the doctrine that once we are justified, we will now begin a process of becoming more like Christ. So the rest of the days of our lives, we become more and more like Christ. Now some of us, we do this. And then we go like this, right? And then we go, right? None of us are perfect, right? We still sin, right? But the idea is that when you look back on your life and you go, how did I look a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago? There is this progression in our lives where we're becoming more like Christ, right? 
And so what free grace theology is teaching is that you can be declared righteous, but this doesn't have to happen. Okay? Following with me? It doesn't have to happen. Now, let's look at verse 6. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. So what Jesus is going to give us now, he's just talked about repenting, right? He's just told him, repent. What he's now going to talk about is judgment for both the nation of Israel and for us. Okay? So this parable is pointing towards the judgment if we don't repent. Jesus had been ministering to the people of Israel for how long? How long had he been ministering in Israel? Three years, years right? Three years. And what had happened so far? They'd rejected him, right? There have been some people that came and, and believed in Jesus and became followers. But as a nation, as a whole, he'd been there three years. Their tree had been planted for three years. And for three years, there was no growth. There was no fruit of revival that Jesus brought to the nation of Israel. But God, in his great mercy, said, let's give them some more time. Let's give them some more time. And so Jesus went, and he died on a cross. And three days later, he rose from the grave. That's a pretty big miracle. That's a pretty big thing. But what did Israel do? They still rejected him. They still chose even after the resurrection, to reject the Messiah. The idea of trees and bearing fruit is a very popular theme throughout the Bible, referring to Christians and to us as well. Look at John 15, 5. Jesus speaking says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. In Matthew 7, 16 through 20, once again, Jesus says, You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Paul, writing to the church of Colossae in one ten, says, As to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Here in Crane... We do not have many fruit trees. But we do have a lot of dead trees. If you came after church and you came and drove down my street, just right over there, you would not drive down the street and go, if we just give this tree more time. No, instead you would drive down the street and go, that tree's dead. That tree's dead. That tree's dead. There's a bunch of dead trees on my street. It's not hard for us. We are able to see dead trees, right? The same is true for Jesus. He is able to see trees that are dead versus trees that are alive and are bearing fruit because of him. For free grace theology, people... All you need is intellectual assent. All you need is to 
intellectually think Jesus is God. There is no need for repentance or turning away from sin. There's no need for a changed heart. There's no need for a changed will. There's no need for good works to happen. There's no need for you to bear fruit. No need for anything like that. Now, they'll tell you, that's good. You should. You should. You should do this. You should bear fruit. You should repent. You should do all these things. But it's not necessary. I want to be real clear. All these things, bearing fruit, showing good works, all this stuff does not save you. Does not save you. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. That is your only hope. But let me tell you this, Christian. When that happens, you should. (laughs) You should Live Just like when you were born the first time, you should grow. When you are born again, you should grow. You should live out a life of repentance. You should live out a life of good works. You should bear fruit if you are a Christian. Ezekiel chapter 36, 26 and 27. This is God speaking to his people. And he says... I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Folks, look at that last verse. It's not God saying to his people, I will put my spirit within you and then I will hope, I will wish... It would be really convenient if you would. But what does God say? He says, and cause you, cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to follow my commands. It's not a, this is what I hope will happen because you've got the mental assent. It is, this is what I will do in you when I change your heart. The things they, they happen right after each other. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you are a Christian, be holy. Don't live the life that you lived before. Live a different life. James 2, 14 through 26. What good is it, brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, Without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he called, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. 
So folks, what we see in these passages, and we can go to tons more, is the Bible is clear that our works do not save us. But they're what happens naturally when you are saved. They are together, together, not separated. They come together in the natural timeline of what it is to be a Christian. The whole purpose of this passage from Jesus to the people that are listening and to us today is to have a sense of urgency. A sense of urgency that don't think you can get right with God somewhere down the line. That you've got plenty of time. Because you know, know what will happen. Whether the consequences of sin have affected this world or God's plan is to teach us something through what's going on, hard times are probably going to come. And those hard times may even lead up to death. I want to caution you of something before we wrap up. What I don't want you to do is to go out today and to think that you are fruit inspectors. That's not what this message is about, to be fruit inspectors, to go out and go around to all the people that say they're Christians and go, I just don't see it. Like, I don't see the fruit in your life. That's not your job, okay? That's not your job is to go and be a professional fruit inspector. But what Jesus is telling us is that each one of us sitting here today needs to be self respective need to have a little introspection of our lives and talk to God and say, hey, is this true of me? Maybe you have a strong Christian friend that you trust that you want to go to and ask them, are you seeing fruit in my life? Or, or do I look like a dead tree? But the goal is not for us all to go around being fruit inspectors and claiming that we know exactly what God's doing in somebody's heart. But the goal is for us to inspect. And so the questions are, how do we know that we're right with God? How do we know that? How can I have assurance that I'm right with God and, and not have to live in doubt that maybe I am a dead tree? How can we do that? How, how can you know for certain whether you're a dead tree or not? Right? Isn't that the question that we all want to know? Isn't that the, the question that rumbles around in the back of our minds is how can I have assurance that God has changed me? So I want to give you three questions that you can go and you can ask yourself. You can go ask a trusted person. But these are three good questions to, to ask. The first is, do I truly believe that Jesus is Lord and he is the only means of my forgiveness and reconciliation with God. Do I believe that? Not just intellectual assent, not just fire insurance that I'm going to say, one day I walked an aisle, one day I said a prayer, one day I got baptized. But down deep in your heart, do you believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and he is your only hope in life and death? Do you really believe that? That's the first question you have to ask yourself. The second question is, do I see the fruit of the Spirit in my life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do I see those things? Am I perfect? No. None of us are perfect. Remember? But at least we're going like this, right? right? So do I see this stuff? Do I look at my life and do I see the fruit of the Spirit and do I see that I'm growing in the fruit of the Spirit? Or do I look at my life and I don't see anything? I don't see that I'm patient. I don't see that I'm kind. I don't see that I have joy. Like, do I see these things in my life? Third question. Do I seek to live for God's glory or mine? is number one person that I think about when I wake up in the morning, all day, and when I go to bed, is it me? Or am I seeking to live for God? Am I seeking that? Those are the questions you should ask yourself. 
And, and maybe some of you, the answer is no. The answer is no to these questions. And, and so maybe you bought into the lie that all I need was intellectual assent and that God doesn't have to change my life. I can live however I want to do and I'm good. Maybe you bought into that. Maybe you didn't know you did, but you did. You bought into that lie. But here's the good news. As we see in this passage, in this parable, God is rich in mercy and grace and forgiveness, and he is slow and patient, and you have time. I don't know how much time you have, but you have time right now to talk to God and say, God, maybe I did buy into it, and, and I just want to tell you I'm all in. I'm all in. I need your forgiveness. I believe in Jesus Christ as my only Lord and Savior. I want to live for him. I want you to develop in me a heart. I want you to change the heart of stone to a heart of flesh. And I want you to cause me to live in your statutes and to obey your will and to live for you. God, I need that. You can do that today. You can ask him to do that, and he will. But there is urgency this is what we've been talking about for the last month is urgency to follow Christ. You cannot wait and hope that tomorrow I can do it. Or a year from now or, or when I get into a different stage of life that I'll get serious. Because none of us are promised tomorrow. And there's no second chances once you die. There's no second chances. And so I encourage you. To know, have I placed my faith in Jesus Christ alone for my forgiveness of sins, for my salvation? I'm going to live my life. Or are you a dead tree? But there is no sign of fruit. There's no sign of God living in your life in any capacity. I want to encourage you to change that today if that's where you sit. If you can honestly look at your life and go, I'm not. I'm not fully trusted in Christ. I am not living for him. I am living for myself. I am not living for the fruits of the spirit, but instead I'm selfish, I'm greedy, I'm angry, I'm depressed. He loves you. This is why he gives us his word, is to tell us these things, not to hide them from us. And so this morning, we're going to pray. And this morning, if you need to get right with God, if you need to be reconciled with God through Jesus Christ, I would love to talk to you. I'll be down front. I would love to pray with you, to talk with you. For those of you who are Christians, who have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, and you look at those questions, you go, yes, 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 amen. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, that is my verse. Then in the back corners, we have communion available. You can go, and you can go thank Jesus for his blood. You can thank him for his grace, for his forgiveness. Whatever you need to do this morning, it's not about the people around you, but it's about where are you with Jesus? Because there is urgency, folks. There is urgency for those of us sitting here. There is urgency for everyone not sitting in here. We have the hope of Jesus Christ to give to people because we're not promised tomorrow, and they aren't either. And we need to care that today could be their last day and they could be apart from Jesus Christ forever. And all, I just, all he's asked us to do, we don't have to save them. You cannot save somebody. All you can do is tell them. All you can do is tell them and let God work in their lives. So let's pray. If you need prayer, come. If you want to do communion, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, do that. Whatever you need to do this morning, talk to God and be grateful. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word, the hard word, that we're not promised tomorrow. Lord, I pray for anyone who has potentially bought into the unbiblical lie that, uh, that they should be healthy. And if they're not, that it's their fault because they don't have enough faith. Lord, I pray that they would just trust in you and that they would look to see, is it because of sin in my life that I'm not well, or is it maybe that you're using that to teach me something? 
And Lord, I pray that we wouldn't buy into the lie, the unbiblical lie, that we can intellectually assent to Jesus Christ, but that doesn't change anything. Lord, I thank you that not only did you come to save us, but you came to change us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us all to live for you, that we would grow in our knowledge, in our love, in living out the fruits of the Spirit, and that we would want to share your word with other people because it is the only hope that we have in life or death is the grace of Jesus Christ. So I thank you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If y'all want to stand, we'll sing our...